Well, it's, um, it's good to be here with you. Um, this presentation, uh, let me tell you a little bit about the background of it. So I direct um, the program at Fletcher called International Security Studies. Um, in, in, uh, in, in Britain, they would call it war studies. And, and that's been um, my interest, um, the study of war. In fact, um, I teach a course in this room in the spring semester, which studies six old wars. So uh, starting with the Peloponnesian War, so that's a, a really old one. Um, in, uh, but my, my particular um, research interest has been in um, wars, not between um, nation states, but wars inside states, and conflicts inside states. And um, this, um, this particular presentation is um, is drawn uh, in part from a course a seminar that I teach um, in the fall called Internal Conflict. Now, you know, when I first started um, teaching a course like this um, a long time ago, uh, it, it really focused on, um, on insurgency and um, uh, guerrilla warfare and so on. Over the years, of course, it's it's morphed and changed because the conflict environment has morphed and changed over the years. Um, in, uh, in recent years, um, actually I guess in maybe the last 10 years, um, uh, because of, um, of Peter Ackerman, who's a good friend of mine, he kept harassing me. Yeah, he's good at harassing, and uh, in a nice way. And he harassed me. He said, well, well you know, uh, how come you're not teaching about um, civil resistance movements in, in your internal conflict class. So, well, you know, I don't know. Let me do a little reading. So he gave me this to read. You know, read this, among other things, as you know. I mean, he, uh, uh, he and this guy here, they'll inundate you with reading. And so, you know, it made a lot of sense that uh, we should uh, include in, in a course that looks at conflict inside states um, movements that use um, strategic uh, nonviolent strategy and tactics. And by the way, I, um, listening to um, the remarks here, uh, one of the things that really struck me about uh, all of this <coughs> is uh, the extent to which there are really um, amazing parallels between um, uh, movements that use civil resistance and other kinds of movements that, that may use violence in their emphasis on strategy. You know, it is really about strategy. And um, I had a wonderful um, doctoral student a few years ago um, who um, uh, did her thesis on, on, on strategy, um, Maria Stefan, you probably know the name. Yeah, she uh, did her dissertation with me. Uh, and so um, what I want to talk about today, you can see it up here, is um, 21st century um, conflict environment and uh, the sources of instability. Now, you know, I'm happy and, and in fact um, quite eager to talk about um, conflict in fragile states and look at the Arab Spring countries if you want to go in that direction. I'm very interested in that and um, particularly interested in, um, in uh, the, the question of, of how do you carry out security sector reform in, in these, um, these countries once um, you have s some political change you still have big institutional problems and challenges. And you know, if you want to touch on that, I'm happy to do it. It's my new research project. And um, I'm actually uh, going with US Institute of Peace to Tunisia in, uh, in November uh, to work with the Tunisians to look at five cases where, strategic, where security sector reform has worked and what kind of lessons they can draw from it. Anyway, um, we're going to look at uh, 21st century uh, conflict environment and the sources of instability. As I said, this um, is drawn from my seminar on internal conflict and also um, from a, a study I did uh, with a fellow in Washington, Roy Gotson. He spends a lot of time working in Mexico these days, um, entitled Adapting America's Security Paradigm and Security Agenda. And um, our interest there was in, uh, in how um, the US needed to, to rethink um, its own um, security policy and strategy, given what we're going to talk about here. So that, those are the origins of, um, 
of the presentation. So let me make a few general remarks and then we'll dig down. So <coughs> my, um, my argument here is that, uh, that the world has changed quite a bit since the end of the Cold War. Now, um, you should have all these slides too, by the way, um, right? They have all the slides? Oh, well, we ought to make sure they, they, they can have them. Yeah, they'll have them. So, um, but um, if you look at the second um, part of that um, first bullet, the patterns of conflict are not unpredictable, but discernible. Now, um, this in, is an argument that I am making, and one that we made in this report, which kind of ran against the way um, the Department of Defense, in, uh, in some of its um, important uh, projections of the future, including, this may not mean anything to you, but every four years the Department of Defense does something called a quadrennial defense review. And that quadrennial defense review is supposed to look out and, and, and make some estimate of what the conflict environment is going to look like because that will drive then requirements for, you know, what kind of forces you need, what kind of money you want to spend on different equipment and so on. And um, the kind of the word uh, uh, from the most recent QDR is that we, we can't figure out what's going on, going on out there. You know, everything is confused and we got to prepare for everything. And, and so I, I really disagree with that. Um, and, and my argument here is that, um, that the, uh, the patterns of conflict are not unpredictable, um, but actually discernible. And, and what they, they tell me is that there's going to be a predominant and, and persistent irregular conflict set of challenges that we're going to see uh, in the near term and I think even beyond the near term. Now, you know, we in this seminar and in the work I do, you know, this is supposed to be analytic. We're not uh, trying to um, propose this should be what we do or that should be what we do. Just trying to figure out what's going on. And, and so, um, the study of, uh, of, of conflict patterns tell us that um, conflict uh, is going to be irregular. Now, what I mean by that is that in security studies, my discipline, um, it, it's generally been thought that conflict is between states. You know, states fight states. And um, uh, that's, uh, that's been the, the general argument, and nations um, prepare. Uh, for those kinds of contingencies. Irregular conflict, conflict that takes place inside a state or can uh, be taking place across borders and even regionally, um, is uh, it involves um, conflict between groups, movements, and states. And so if you look at the post-Cold War period, and now we're two decades into it, so you know, there's some evidence there. What you'll see is that um, irregular challenges um, have been um, the predominant form of conflict. It's not that states um, may not uh, go to war with one another, but if you just look at, if you just read the New York Times, you're going to figure this out. The Pentagon didn't figure it out, but New York Times did. Um, that conflict today uh, and, uh, and in the past uh, two decades has, uh, been, has involved um, non-state actors challenging the state. Now, the environment generating these irregular challenges, whether they're by armed non-state actors or um, non-state actors using civil resistance as a strategy, and by the way, both are coercive. One of the reasons for sticking, I think, and you know, according to Peter Ackerman, who you know, harassed me about this for <laughs> half a decade, um, the, the reality is that both are using coercion to try to force change. Um, it, and in fact, in the Arab Spring, you can see uh, both kinds of approaches um, taking place. You know, uh, Egypt, uh, one, one strategy. Um, uh, Libya, different one. So the, the point, though, is that um, the environment, what, what is the environment 
generating these irregular challenges. And um, why do I think that this is going to um, continue into the future? So that's kind of the question we're going to try to address. Um, patterns exist. Um, today's world is, uh, is, but today's world is not understandable through the lens of um, 20th century conflict and security paradigm. You know, uh, academics love to use the word paradigm. <laughs> yeah, we, we can't do without it. Um, and the, the 20th century, <laughs> it's true. true. It is true. You know, we have to always use these, the, this paradigm thing. Um, the 20th century conflict paradigm uh, and the way that um, most uh, academics who were, in, who were in security studies thought about 20th century conflict was in this traditional or conventional um, approach to, uh, to war. But um, you know, my argument is that a decade into the uh, 21st century, now beyond a decade, um, we, can, uh, we can see that irregular conflict, and here's my definition of it, uh, defined as a struggle among state and non-state actors for legitimacy, influence, control over relevant populations, and, uh, and it involves coercive means. Uh, through coercive means, um, non-state actors seek to erode a state's power. Um, its influence, and its will. So uh, that's irregular conflict. Interestingly enough, um, uh, the, um, the former um, Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe, Rupert Smith, who um, uh, I use, he has a very good book on, uh, on, war, on war in the 21st century. Rupert Smith uh, argued uh, in, uh, in this book, The Utility of Force, that irregular conflict is, is a complex and inherent, uh, inherently political activity. And he said uh, he, his, his main argument here is that these wars, now he's talking about war. He's not talking about um, civil resistance. He's talking about irregular conflict by armed groups. He, but he said these conflicts are going to take place, his uh, famous phrase, amongst the people. And, and that is going to change um, how you have to think about uh, and, uh, and, and address conflict, whether you are a state, whether you're an NGO, um, whether you're a, an international organization, so on. And here's the passage that I really like from his book. He said, there it is, even generals use that word. A paradigm shift in war has undoubtedly occurred from armies with compatible forces doing battle to a confrontation between a range of combatants, state and non-state, using different types of weapons, often improvised. So the old paradigm, interstate war, gives way to the new paradigm, war amongst the people. And, um, you know, Smith uh, argued, leaders have who have failed to grasp this underlying shift in the, par in, uh, in the paradigm of warfare Leaders have failed to grasp this. Now, this is true. This is very true, for example, for the United States as it entered some of the wars that it's been in since 9-11. Um, very true, for instance, in Iraq. It took the United States uh, a couple of years to figure out that the conflict in Iraq had to be prosecuted, not in the way that they normally prepare for war. This led to um, the emergence of what I call the second counterinsurgency era. So counterinsurgency has been a big subject for the United States, second counterinsurgency era. I have a, actually a new book coming out on the Marine campaign in, uh, in Iraq and counterinsurgency. But what is missing from General Smith's analysis is that he's thinking of irregular conflict only as armed irregular conflict, only as groups, non-state actors, who are using armed violence. And so his analysis is limited from the point of view of the way we should think about the conflict environment. His view of coercive in instruments are confined to um, the use of 
violent ones or the use of uh, weapons. Um, and so uh, we, we broaden this out in, in the way that I teach it um, and, and propose that uh, uh, there are a range of possibilities for challenging the state. In some cases, it does take armed form. In Libya, it did. In Egypt, it didn't. You know, in Syria, it's been a hybrid. Um, and, uh, but uh, the, the, the issue that we want to get at is why are these movements, whether they're armed or uh, using uh, other forms of coercion, why have they been on the increase? How come over the last two decades in particular, and you could stretch this back a little bit further, but at least since the end of the Cold War, why is this uh, the predominant uh, form of conflict? And why do I say that this trend is here to stay for the foreseeable future and that it constitutes the prevalent pattern of instability that will affect different regions of the world? And, and the reason for that, whoops, Um, uh, we have to look at uh, the factors contributing to these irregular conflict trends. And um, I'm going to argue that it has to do with the state. That we um, have in the world we live in today um, a significant number of weak states unable to control their territory or to govern effectively. And they provide the conditions for um, groups, armed and non-armed, um, to, uh, to challenge the state and to burgeon or to grow. And, and these, uh, this situation provides the context in which um, non-state actors uh, seek uh, to bring about political change uh, in, uh, in their particular context. Now, um, I gave you some readings. Uh, it's for you to take with you, but they're useful. Um, there have been some really good analytic projects that have attempted to explain weakness of states. They're not perfect. No analytic framework is perfect. But um, there are some good ones, and the ones that, um, that I particularly like uh, uh, one is from the Fund for Peace, which is the Failed State Index, and their Conflict Assessment Indicators. I think they're pretty useful. Um, the Brookings Institution has another one called the Index of, uh, of State Weakness. It was um, uh, originally done by Susan Rice, now the UN Ambassador. And um, I put a, an article on there also by um, myself and uh, some of my colleagues on uh, states in the 21st century. Now, what we, we, if we look at that material, if we delve into um, those, uh, for instance, take a look at the uh, failed state index for 2011 or um, the index, uh, the um, project done by uh, Rice and, uh, and Stuart Patrick, index of state weakness, what you're going to find is the following sorts of numbers. So what, uh, what these uh, studies suggest is that there are a significant number of states in the world that are weak, and you can see them there. Um, some are weak democracies, uh, some are uh, authoritarian, and there are a handful of states that um, could be categorized as, uh, as failing. Now, um, as this graphic suggests, um, uh, this, if, if we take these uh, indicators, if we take the analysis of a failed state index and, and the other one by Brookings, if we take them seriously, what it suggests to us is that uh, there are uh, a number of states that are not uh, doing the things that, uh, that we expect um, a state to do in terms of performance. And let me just go here. 
So what we, when we talk about weak states, whether democratic or authoritarian, and by the way, let me just go back here. Look at the number of weak states that are characterized as democratic. Now, that's pretty interesting. Um, these aren't uh, uh, liberal democracies. These are new democracies. And what's interesting, uh, of course, about uh, that issue is that, that many of these states have competition going on within them. You know, there are democratic forces, there are other forces competing for power. And um, I think uh, that, uh, and, and actually a big concern of the report I did, was um, the issue of who's going to help them? Um, who's going to assist them so that democratic forces um, prevail over uh, uh, non-democratic ones? We'll come back to that question. But if you... When we uh, say that a state is weak, uh, what we mean by this is that, first of all, um, it's unable to, um, uh, to exercise um, legitimate control over its territory. And, and in fact, um, uh, in, in many weak states, there are, there are areas in that state uh, that, are, uh, that have no real um, government presence. Second, um, weak states um, are unable to maintain a legitimate monopoly over the use of force, and the use of force is regulated by the rule of law. So that's a second aspect of weak states. A third is um, they're unable to perform core functions. And and these core functions begin with the security of individuals. And in fact, in, in many weak states, what we see is that from the point of view of human security, there's a real crisis going on. So, <coughs> but the other core functions as well. I mean, basic things that government is supposed to do. So weak states can afford opportunities for armed groups uh, to exploit, and I put some examples down there of places where um, different types of armed groups, some with legitimacy, some without, are challenging the state. And, um, but they also, weak states also, can, um, uh, can be locations where nonviolent movements likewise can become empowered and can challenge the capacity of the state to rule. Now these um, non-state actors can use an array of protracted, irregular, violent, and nonviolent strategies. And you've been talking a great deal about um, uh, civil resistance strategies, but there's a whole literature and a whole body of, of information on how uh, uh, strategy is employed um, by, by armed groups. Now, the conditions fostering weak and failing states, um, the, the last bullet is the most important one, and that is that these things are difficult to reverse. You know, it's one thing to do an assessment of the problem. It's another thing to, um, to walk the situation back. And so the conditions fostering uh, weak and failing states um, are, are not easy to reverse. At least that's, um, that's what uh, the, the literature tells us. And the reason for that is that there's a crisis of state legitimacy. Now, um, what the uh, previous slide suggests is that we're facing and we will continue to face um, this crisis of state legitimacy. One of the books that I really like um, is the one that you see up here by K.J. Holstey. The State War and the State of War. And, and what Holstey um, looks at is, uh, and, and, and it's in a new edition now, uh, he looks at the causes of, of conflict uh, in, uh, in, in the post-Cold War period. And, and he argues that 
the causes of conflict today they're not due to disagreements between states. That's the old paradigm. Rather, it is the outcome of domestic politics and the nature of political community inside the state. Now, what he means by that is, when he says the problem is the state and political community or communities inside the state, what he means is that the state and its population or uh, elements of its population uh, are at, at uh, serious odds with one another. And here are characteristics, let me go one more slide, characteristics of, uh, of state legitimacy. So, so a su successful states are based on two concepts of legitimacy, what he calls um, uh, sh a shared or agreed to set of political principles and a shared definition of political community. Now, as you know, many states, in terms of their political community, don't have one. But they may have many, and it may cut across um, I different identity uh, factors. So um, measures of a successful state, uh, there they are, um, capacity and right to govern. Capacity and, and the right to govern. Um, uh, the capacity to extract resources to provide services. You know, extracting services are the purpose for which resources are extracted. The capacity to maintain essential elements of sovereignty, uh, to maintain a monopoly over the legitimate use of force, and to exercise force within the rule of law and the capacity to govern within a consensus-based political community. Now, those are the measures of a successful state. What Holstein tells us is that many of those weak states that were uh, in the numbers that I gave you, many of those weak states have a serious legitimacy problem that divides along vertical and horizontal lines. And let me take a little time to explain this, uh, what he means by vertical legitimacy and horizontal legitimacy. Vertical legitimacy is concerned with um, authority, consent, and loyalty to the political basis of the state and its institutions. Now, when we say authority, consent, and loyalty, by whom? by the population. So there is a shared set of political principles that authorizes the leader's right to govern. And I use the word govern rather than rule. It's the right to govern. Um, now, for, for modern democratic states, it's based on consent or contract. There's a contract between the state and its population. Vertical legitimacy can be equated with political rule derived from moral authority granted to the population. Now, there's a key question in all of this that um, when I teach this, um, uh, I always hear this, and that is, um, who has moral authority? Is it only uh, democracies that have it? Or are there other types of regimes that can have it as well? And I'll leave that question for us to, to talk about later, or we could talk about it now. Of course, you know, many tend to believe it's only um, liberal democracies that, that have moral authority, that other types of, of um, states do not have it. Um, now, there's an interesting argument that, that's being made that where the state doesn't have moral authority, there may be other elements in the society that have moral authority. But is it the case that um, in terms of type of government, that it's only democracies that can have moral authority? Well, you can ruminate on that uh, and, uh, and we'll come back to that point later on. 
for example, um, uh, I had um, a very interesting student from Bahrain last year who um, uh, was trying to convince me that the, the existing government in Bahrain, Bahrain has uh, moral authority. So, yeah, we had an interesting discussion about that. In a, in a democratic system, you know, it is based on um, the acceptance of the political leadership and their right to rule or govern, not rule. And, and usually it takes place through a variety of mechanisms, including not only elections, but including elections. And isn't that also how they give sort of the consent contract as well as through... Well, and the contract can be formalized, too. So contract can take the form of a written document, many places it does. And, and, but the, the, the um, enforcement of those laws and, and, and rules are in a, another aspect of whether or not a state has moral authority. You know, lots of constitutions have been written in the past that have no standing with the population because they have no meaning. Other questions? If you want to ask me questions, you're allowed to. Yeah. Is it, I'm not sure if I can figure out a good way to ask it, but is it part of the problem here that you know, the whole idea of the nation state hasn't been around that long? Like, like we've been here four million years, we've had nation states the last sliver of it. And in fact, in the, in the world, we have maybe three or four thousand nations. And and a couple hundred nation states. That's right. And so part of the, part of what's happening now is it seems like there are all kinds of we're in a kind of radical transformation where these networks of people are getting intermixed and intertwined. And the only kind of overarching institution we have, the United Nations, was set up on that nation state model. And even the UN has been morphing you know, kind of all these kind of informal groups, the indigenous forum and so on. So it seems like part of uh, what's interesting to us, and in nonviolent civil resistance, uh, the idea is that there's power outside of the state. Sure. And that's kind of at the core of, of the theory. And so my question is, you know, how do we how do we mobilize people around this transition period in a sense to use what what you're what what you're calling a crisis as a window of opportunity? to reorganize the plan in a way that is truly democratic and not just a bunch of, you know, kind of, I mean, it's a great experiment, parliamentary democracy, but it seems like we're moving beyond that. Of course, it's how do we do, what, what can we learn from this crisis to move forward? Well, it's a huge question. Um, what, if we think about um, the, uh, the, the movements that have have challenged um, the Arab states. I mean, they're operating within the context of not uh, getting rid of the state, but um, making the state more representative of um, the populations that live inside uh, those borders. Now, the interesting thing, one, uh, you made a lot of good points. I'm going to pick up on one, and that is that in many places, the state encompasses a variety of identities. And, and one of the reasons I believe that many states are in trouble today um, and fall into this category of, of weak state, meaning weak in that they're not performing the functions that you uh, expect. A, um, a state with legitimacy to perform is exactly this problem of identity. There are a number of identities in, uh, within the state, but this, the, the, the state does not represent them. And in, in, in many ways, the experiment of the state, and especially the post-World War II experiment, was to create or, or to uh, give legitimacy to all these <coughs> new uh, entities called states, but they don't really pay a lot of attention to, to the internal composition of it. If you go back and look at um, the, uh, the, the origins of the UN and how it thought about 
uh, new states coming in. Um, it, it, didn't, it didn't give enough attention to this question of how do you um, address all these differences? How do you create a political identity that is the state? And, 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 and it represents all of those uh, populations that are part of it. Um, this is what um, Holstein calls um, horizontal legitimacy, and that is you, you can actually have states where um, uh, you have a, a type of vertical legitimacy for one particular group, uh, and, and then the rest are left out. Uh, Syria is a, a really good example of this today. Everyone has Syria on their mind, I'm sure. And, and if you think about Syria, you have one identity, which is, um, uh, represents about 11% of the population, and, and the ref, rest is left out. So the issue of, of, how to, of, of legitimacy within Syria um, is confined to a narrow stovepipe or a narrow part of the population. And this is a big, this is a major problem in, uh, uh, it's not the only problem, but it is one of the big problems for states today. And that is, they have not um, developed the means uh, for managing difference. Um, or the means that they've developed for managing difference is rather unfair uh, to, to many of uh, those elements in the, in the society. Yes. No, just could you just continue on the Bahrain example with the student? Yeah, well, you know, again, in Bahrain, I mean, her argument was that the ruling family had a legitimacy with the population, and, and it didn't, it, it, it manifested itself not in, you know, a, a vocal or an expressed legitimacy, but um, because the, the ruling family was like a family. She said, we take care of the population. I, I said, well, it doesn't look like it. And at least a, a lot of them don't agree with you on this. You know, they seem to think that, uh, that, that you don't represent them uh, very well. And this is an argument that's made, as you know, throughout the, the Gulf. I mean, throughout the Gulf, you hear this uh, about legitimacy and, and, and family. Yes. Uh, I would like to ask you about uh, when the state does not have a moral legitimacy in case of uh, the loss of moral basis in governance, following with what Lester said, because there are many nationalities and uh, the constitution does not quite reflect the aspirations of just aspirations of the many national communities. In such a situation, constitution is not responsive. It's not mean. And then, Armed or unarmed conflicts are only natural in such a situation. And I'm not saying which is right, but in terms of conflict resolution, and if those societies themselves are unable to resolve the conflicts, and we are talking about violations of human rights, violations of, like, including genocide, yeah. and um, how should we resolve that? Should there be an international mechanism? That's a very good question. Um, you know, the, the, I would phrase it this way. Um, uh, should, should we, the, the international system has been biased towards um, accepting states, uh, state legitimacy. And so um, it, it, it wasn't something that could be challenged. Now, in, in the aftermath of the Cold War, we started to see this, uh, 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 the possibility that a state's legitimacy was contingent. Contingent on what? Contingent on performance. Okay, so in, in, if, if a state doesn't perform uh, effectively, then, then it's, it loses its legitimacy. Now, what does that mean for the international community? Should the, does the international community, when the state not only loses its legitimacy, but rather than, than, than um, guaranteeing human security, they're trampling human security, then should the internet, does the international community have a responsibility to do something about it? And, and of course, from my point of view, the answer is yes, but the international community doesn't see it that way, especially the, 
the, the, the United Nations. United Nations. They're, they're, you know, they've moved. Now we have this responsibility to protect. Now it advances the ball. But um, the, the idea that, um, that the international community will guarantee the human security of, of those who are being trampled, um, it doesn't always work out. And we can see it right now, right now, in the debate over Syria. What should the international community do? What should the UN do? What should NATO do? Is there uh, something that, that they should do to help facilitate change in Syria? Well, there's a big debate over this. I have my own point of view on this, but uh, there is no agreement on this. And, and, and this is, I think, in part because many states aren't going to support uh, these kinds of initiatives because they think that those intervening forces may end up visiting them. Mm -hmm. Right? They may visit me because, you know, okay, I'm not as bad as, 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 as Syria right now, but, you know, uh, you know, this thing catches on. Um, then there's, there's going to be, um, you know, hell to pay. Yes. Well, is that your point of view? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, and my view on Syria is that, that you know, if, if, if I were um, ruling the world for, for the day, I'd create a no-go zone in uh, northwest Syria. And uh, no-go. No, 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 no one is going up there uh, in armored columns or anything else. Kind of like the um, no-fly zone that was created in in, in the Kurdish area of Iraq. They call it a no-fly zone. That was a misnomer. It was a no-go zone. No one goes there in any uh, kind of force. You take an armored column up there, it's not going to be there. So, you know, that would be my, my position. Not everyone agrees with this, you know, and, and that's my, my view, but I think you need to create a safe haven. Um, but the, the, you can see, and this is on the table. I mean, I'm not saying anything that is radical. But the, but the international community, i.e. UN or NATO, can't bring themselves to do that. What happens in such a situation is that the source, the problem, the source of the conflict is the state. And we are going back to the same state system to resolve the conflict, while the fear that you're expressing is genuinely of the fear of the state, not of the society, civil societies. And uh, so that continuously civil society, the conflict will prevail, and the state will seek for more and more security in terms of the power and its Well, different. you know, if you, yes and no. I mean, if I kind of look at Syria now, um, uh, my own view is that, um, I mean, it's my view, that uh, Assad's days are numbered. Uh, the, the question is, you know, at, at what point will that crossover come? But, you know, there are things that are happening that are, um, they're, 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 they're interesting, okay? Um, generals are starting to defect. Big deal. Um, uh, there uh, are more, there are units, small, that are starting to break away. So all of this um, tells me that, uh, that, that it's a fluid environment. Now, what will, you know, what, what should be done uh, you know, that that's something for um, government, U, U, UN, uh, I think NATO, um, to uh, to to try to figure out. But um, to me, it's a, a fluid situation, and the military is the key there. As was the military was the key in Tunisia, and the military was the key in Egypt. The military was the key in the breakdown of the military in Libya. Um, it is about the military in these places. Yeah. I was just going to say, what's your opinion on what should be done, and what do you think would be done? Well, I don't know what will be done. My, my view is that you create a safe haven, and, and then that safe haven 
um, becomes a place where you know those in opposition can can form in, in effect a, a de facto regime, and and you give it protection, and 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 you let it sort of start to grow out. Now, and you protect it. I'm not sh I, I'm not in favor of arming. You know, this is, uh, you hear this in Washington a lot, arm the resistance. No, protect it. Surely if they're going to grow, they'll grow with arms. Well, not necessarily. I mean, I can envision creating a safe haven and then, then letting it advance. They don't do fighting. But uh, your ability to protect mm. makes, uh, that, makes that area not... Uh, challengeable. Is it possible to make a distinction between offering protection to civilians for purposes of their human security and their self-organization without offering a no-go zone that somehow favors certain political groups which are engaging in resistance for their own political purposes? I think you can, but I think that takes a political strategy on the part of those that 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 protect that area. Yes. Why not? Do you think? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, there's two in the back. Sorry, all the way? Uh, uh, I want to know, in your opinion, what was the weakness of NATO and the United States uh, for, for operating safety and security in Libya after, after the intervention? Because, you know, how many people killed there, you know, so I wanna know your well, my, my view on what happened in Libya was that um, the, you know, the, the NATO had, a, had a, a strategy of providing air support. Um, but it, it doesn't look like it had a very good strategy for what happens when the regime comes down and, and how do you try to use um, <coughs> political suasion, economic assistance, and so on um, to, to, sh to uh, you know, shape a post-conflict environment um, that, that um, is based on um, liberal principles. So that to me was missing in, uh, in, in the NATO strategy. And you, you know, you can see it now. I mean, there's some sort of little efforts that are taking place. How do you reshape the, pol how do you shape a police force? How do you demobilize the military? Um, and, and, and things like that. But from, from my point of view, there wasn't a really good um, day after uh, program for, for, for Libya. And I think that, that also um, was true in terms of um, at least Washington's thinking um, for the day after in several other places as well. You know, Egypt, for example. Oh, here's the next. Yes, this, this, uh, this definition of states as failing or fail, fail we, or we, weak states, don't you think you are victimizing the victim again? Because at least in the case of DRC, it is documented that they never had a chance of the independence. There, were, there was intervention by Belgium. There was a lot of support for the former dictator. And uh, then after that, of course, the internal dynamics. But in the case of DRC, so somebody is to blame for, for it becoming a failed state. So when you come around and start calling me a failed state, and you played a party in making me fail. Sure. No, look, See, this is, we, no, I, I understand what you're saying, and you know, we have an hour here. But when I teach this, of course, we look at how in the aftermath of independence, you know, former colonial powers um, carried out policies and provided assistance and, and support in ways that facilitated um, the, the domination of politics by um, authoritarian elements. So, you, you know, you, I mean, I, um, you and I are in, in violent agreement uh, on this point. I'm fine. Yes. 
I, I feel like this is kind of slip. What often happens? Uh, war is so fascinating that we slip into this war paradigm, mm -hmm. and it's. We talked a lot yesterday in here about the importance of strategy, tactics, long-term thinking. Does the United States, do the Western powers, do they have a long-term way of thinking about what seems to be the more prevalent forms of conflict uh, and civil resistance, which is nonviolent? Do you know that they have ever or are now giving any assistance to groups that are uh, in nonviolent resistance situations? Or is it really a kind of wait till a place melts down, and then the question becomes, do we use what we know how to use, which is military force, or don't we? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Um, I, uh, you know, from what I know about the US government, um, the idea that, that there is deep understanding of what you, all of you are studying I, I don't think you'll find much <laughs> deep understanding. I, I, I just don't think you will. Um, I, how do I explain that? Um, you know, I, I think part of it actually has to do with the way that um, uh, we have, uh, as uh, in academia, for instance, how we've thought about um, conflict and war. You know, we've tended to think about it, and we've tended to think about conflict as a form of, of, of armed fight. And um, if you just, for example, I can tell you that most security studies programs, and we have a number of security studies programs in, in different you know, universities, most of them don't have this, when you're studying, in their curriculum at all, you know, because it, it you know, it doesn't, it just doesn't fit um, the way that that you you learn to think about these kinds of issues. So, and and it's a fact. I mean, just if you just were to to look at um, different security studies programs, you, you you wouldn't find it. Now, okay, here at Fletcher, we include it. And we're trying to include more of them. You know, trying to rope Jack over here into coming up this uh, this year during the year and, and doing a series of presentations, which he's agreed to. So I've roped him in. Um, but but I think part of it is, you know, it's a way, you know, institutions, disciplines develop ways of thinking. And, and so when you, you try to have a, a change in a way of thinking, it, 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 it's hard. Um, it's interesting that I was quite encouraged um, by uh, when Gates was the Secretary of Defense, not that he understood what you're interested in, but one of the things that he argued for was that we would, we would use our, our security tools uh, early to try to help these weak regimes before they get into deep trouble. And, and one of the things that he wanted to focus on, which is what I'm working on now, is how you reform security institutions <coughs> called security sector reform so that those institutions um, fit within the rule of law and, uh, and, and, and don't uh, aren't instruments uh, to to control uh, uh, and, and keep a particular uh, element in power. So that to me was encouraging. But the idea that the, the U.S. government would have a uh, deep understanding of this, I just don't think they do. Now maybe I'm uh, I'm in, up here in Boston, and, and, and some of, some of our. Our, our hosts here are in Washington. Maybe they, they they're more encouraged, but I I don't I don't see it. Let me. Um, who else? Oh, sorry, there, there are three hands up over here: Gypsy, Jugga, and DJ. All right, Gypsy. Uh, um, thank you so much. Can you comment a little bit about legitimacy versus sovereignty and the arguments around that, as well as the legitimacy um, or or perceived lack 
of legitimacy of some movements. Um, well, of right. movements or of, uh, let me start with sovereignty. You yeah. know, the concept of sovereignty um, as, it, uh, as it emerged um, was, was the acceptance of, of the state, the, for instance, when new states came into the international system. Once they were recognized, and who recognized them? The United Nations recognized them. Then, then with that recognition went sovereignty. They were sovereign over their territory. They had a right to govern that territory. They were recognized as such. Now, the interesting thing, I think, since the end of the Cold War, is this question of whether sovereignty should be contingent on something. In the old way of thinking about sovereignty, it was, it was not contingent on performance. Sovereignty was accepted um, by the international body, and therefore um, the state had a legitimacy to it, granted by, by this recognition. Um, today, many would argue that the state has to, that, 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 that sovereignty is contingent. Contingent on what? Contingent on performance. It, it, it has to perform uh, a certain way. It has to follow uh, a, a certain uh, criteria to, to maintain sovereignty. Now, a state can lose sovereignty. Well, um, they, they, this is where it gets dicey. This is where it gets dicey for the international system. Who's going to determine that state's lost sovereignty? So that's but it's, it seems to be used as an excuse. Well, because you know, and as a defense all the time, and it seems to be a legitimate defense that lends legitimacy yeah. to the continuation of oppression. Basically, and it does. And, and and so what went on? What goes on inside the state is the response is the the concern of who's in charge inside the state. Um, and you know that's been the standing way of thinking about this for a long time. Kissinger, um, when he initiated the, the detente policy with the Soviet Union, um, Kissinger made the argument that that as long as the Soviet Union is a status quo power in terms of, of not expanding, we don't care what they do inside. That's their business. Yeah, well, yeah, Soviet Union was one of the largest producers of gulags in the world. Um, but it didn't matter. And in many ways, you know, this issue of sovereignty has, has granted a kind of legitimacy to these dictatorial regimes. But no, but, you know, in the last 20 years, I would say, you know, when I used to taught this in the Cold War, now I teach it post Cold War, and now 21st century. Oh, there's change taking place. Not everyone buys this. Idea. I mean, none of you. Right? Yeah. We have two more questions. Jaga, DJ, and then Imran. See, my related, my question is related to this question. So, if this is what we call a two-fisted. <laughs> Actually, when we talk about sovereignty, uh, and you said the state is not performing, then I mean, how that uh, you know concept of responsibility to protect works. I mean, I'd just like to know. Well, yeah. I mean, this is the I mean, this is the, the sort of the, the the advancing of the ball. Now we have this responsibility to protect. Um, but uh, and you could see it um, used uh, in the Libyan example. Um, but why isn't it used in the Syrian? Example? because of the, the, the kind of conservatism on the part of you know, the major states. So you know, how far will you go with responsibility to protect? I, I would say that um, a case in point would be um, Syria right now. But politics and disagreement make it hard to, to apply that in as vigorous a way as maybe you and I would like. Yeah, but then it makes things very severe as well. I mean, like well, of course, people die because, because you don't want to make the decision to protect. Right. How many have to die before you do this? Right? How many have to die? Well, we 10,000. Well, no, we've crossed 10,000. So, I mean, these are awful 
you know, when you think about how awful this is, but it's a reality. Uh, uh, okay, my, my question is related uh, basically in uh, my country, the peace process. It's a, uh, uh, do you have any uh, assessment of the role of the neighboring countries or United Nations for the peace process? It's a, it's a, it's a role of the, like, the uh, fairly state or the success state. In, in our case, when there was an the army, they could not solve the problem. But when left the army, within one year, the PLA integrated it in the uh, national uh, army. So, I, I, so, I have to say, I, I don't know much about Nepal. But, but, but I, uh, my question is, is there an important role to the neighboring country or the uh, United sure. Nations? Well, no, I mean, neighboring countries can, can play a helpful role uh, in, uh, in, in situations like this. So there's, now I think that, you know, there, there's an, an interesting issue about um, how you, you bring these uh, non-state militaries and militaries together and how you manage that kind of integration, which is very important to um, post-conflict settlement. But in principle, um, neighboring powers can be helpful or they can be harmful. You can think of examples both ways. And, and There's no rule that says neighboring powers are necessarily helpful or not helpful. And then the, 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 the another question is, it, it, uh, do you have any assessment on the, if there are uh, mostly the democracy, uh, it's a moment for the democracy or the moment for the power? It's a, yeah. That, that, that. Are we in a democratic moment? <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, we're, we're in a, we're, we're in a period of, of, I think, significant change in, in, in certainly in the Middle East. And, and that change, we haven't seen the end of it. And I don't know where the outcome is, but I remember when this, this started, uh, I thought that it was like a tsunami, a political tsunami. Uh, and, and, and I'm not sure about outcome, but uh, it's not over. Uh, in terms of change. And, and, and I think today, because of the fact that you all were talking about communications earlier, communication is very important to um, awareness. Um, it's, it's one of the most important things, and it, 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 it makes for a, a much different context today than the context of, of 20 years ago. 20 years ago, uh, even. Yeah. If you think about, I mean, everyone has Syria on the mind. I have Syria on the mind. You know, when 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 um, uh, Assad's father faced this kind of situation, um, he he just he could do things that 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 his son, even though his son is doing some pretty awful things, can't go as far as his father. There are different dynamics today. So, is it a democratic moment? I think it's a moment of change, and I'm hoping that you know that change is in the direction of uh, democratic uh, movements and democratic uh, evolution. I think I think DJ first, and then we can go to some hands up. This is following up on something that um, you all were discussing earlier. This is a little more specific to America, but also to the of this. We love that. Sure. Um, we were discussing a little bit this earlier. This is more specific to America, but I'm asking it sort of towards an eye of its global impact. Um, would you say that American historiography has kind of um, noblized and romanticized armed conflict to a point that it's been incorporated into our culture, um, and that that has some sort of a effect or impact on our global presence in the world? Um, I don't. I mean, I wouldn't say that that um, there's a sort of a I wouldn't say that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, that certainly um, the United States has, uh, as a let's say, 20th century United States, has thought about um, the use of force um, in, in many ways um, as a, a last resort, not as a, not in, in a Klaus Witzi. We all study Klaus Witzi, the mm -hmm. Prussian uh, theorist of war, who says that, that you know you need to think of 
of war as an instrument of statecraft, not a last resort. But um, the, the United States has tended to think about it, um, I think, in my study of, of U.S. thinking on force, as a, as a last resort. We would like to think of force as in the use of war and force as abnormal, not as normal. Now, I, I think that that may be true for more for, for the democratic culture, which wants to think about um, peace as the norm and war as the exception. Um, now, Clausewitz tells us uh, you can think that way, but it'll get you in trouble. So, you know, that, but that's a, that's a philosophical argument. Um, the, it, you know, the, the decisions to use force sometimes have been ill-conceived by the United States, for sure. We have some immediate examples that come to mind. But um, to say that, that, that war is seen as a normal, normal statecraft, I don't think so. I mean, that's my, I mean, you, you may disagree. We, we have a, a follow-on question from Ruby and um, Julia. And, and then we'll, we'll, we'll and Ruby's, yours, yours is follow-on as well? Uh, yeah, mine is linked to the question that was raised on the responsibility to protect. Mm. Um, and from what you're saying, it appears it, it's an ineffective um, tool that exists. Um, and uh, as you pointed out, it's clear that the R2P this way of applying, the way it's being applied right now shows a tendency towards people wanting to see thousands of bodies lying on the streets first before it can be, it can be used and it seems intervention um, that is justified on the responsibility to protect is very limited. So what would you say uh, would be another way in which there could be global recognition of the importance of human security and in what other way would it, would it be codified besides the responsibility to protect? And I'm asking this question specifically um, coming from the Zimbabwean context, where we have had so many deaths, but the, uh, you don't see dead bodies on the streets in Zimbabwe. There's so many human rights violations. And there was a time when we really thought that maybe um, the responsibility to protect should have applied in our scenario, but it wasn't used for political reasons, of course. So what other? mechanism do you envisage would be useful for situations like that? It's a hard question. I don't want to be overly negative about responsibility for that. I think we've advanced the, the ball as a as an international community. Um, but the the reality is that that we we there are plenty of places and you can rightfully point to Zimbabwe as an example of where the international community has not been resilient in the way that it's approached that situation. So, you know, what what are the alternatives? Who who's going to you know, maybe it, it's a I don't know. I mean maybe, you know, ultimately it's going to be in Zimbabwe that it frees itself and it's not free by or help by external powers, um, and so so is the answer, you know, the kind of thing that you're studying here, which can become so empowering that even regimes like that um, don't don't last. I mean, I think that's a big big question. I don't have a good answer, <clears throat> but um, you know, one of the things I've come to believe is that um, uh, people can really make a difference in, in challenging even awful states, not just you know, mildly terrible ones, but, but, the, but those that are, are really horrendous. And, um, uh, and we, we've seen it. So maybe ultimately, you know, it's a whole redefining of power. Um, and, and, and how power is exercised. And we might just be, you know, on the, the cusp of, of, of this reordering of, of power. Okay. Maybe? Yeah. I'm sorry, I can, Ruby, and Jack, do you mind following Ruby? Yeah. I'm sorry. 
party. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, my question actually is to me with the project on the So that's it. I'm just wondering who actually had the right to decide the state failure? And then what is the positive and, and negative implication when you declare that a state failure? And then the other run for international agency, for example, when they do intervention to help state failure, what 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 will be the best model that they would like to impose that? Well, hey, ask me, so let, let's go by the numbers here, because you got about five yeah. questions in there. So give me the first one, and I'll try to answer it, and then we'll come to the second one. OK, so the first one was, who, who decides? Well, you know, what I've put, what I've presented are analytic assessments. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these are uh, people like myself and other, you know, academics who've looked at, you know, how do you measure um, state performance? And, and, and what are the indicators of a state that performs well as opposed to one that doesn't perform well? Those that don't perform well then are are, are, are talked about as being weak. They're not, by the way, there, there are weak states that are weak in terms of, of most of these indicators, but quite capable of maintaining control because of the institutions of repression that, that they're, they're able to exercise. But who decides um, here is really an analytic exercise by um, academics who are trying to determine um, uh, indicators of effective performance, and if you you know if you dig down into some of the readings I, I gave you, you can really see what those indicators are. We don't have a lot. We don't have the time to go by looking into the indicators, but that's that's kind of the way this came about. Now, when when this is used by you know when a, a political leader uh, mentions something like this, it can become incendiary. Um, remember a year or so ago when Mexico was called a weak state or a failing state? Oh my God! You know, uh, this uh, this then became politically very charged. Um, is Mexico a weak state? You know, if you use those indicators, you'd, you'd have to say that there are certain aspects of Mexico that you would definitely say fall into weak uh, the categorization of weakness, like not being able to control part of their territory. Second, now, next question. So the positive and, and negative implication for the state's value? Well, look, it, I mean, positive and negative, it, it, it you know, it, it, it's how it affects population. Yeah. So, you know, these, these states that are in, in weak condition, yeah, it has a bad effect on the population in many cases you know, starting with their own, the secure, individual security, and then move, moving out to, um, you know, having any access to um, uh, uh, the, the um, things that a state is supposed to provide. So, you know, who, who does it affect? State weakness affects people. Mm -hmm. Right. And then what, which, which the best model that that can be? Because, you know, like, I am I'm always having a model that's implemented in developing countries. In fact, it's not really helping out. You know, we got to just collapse because I'll be trapped into debt. And then we go like privatization and go on. And, and it's not a good model either. So that's which one is a good model that could be well, implemented. Well, you know, one of my, my work right now is to take a look at how, how security institutions <coughs> Can, uh, can be, be improved, um, called security sector reform. And uh, the more I look into it, and, uh, I find that um, there are plenty of great models for security sector reform. Uh, terrific strategies and all that. The problem is getting those uh, in power to accept the reform of security institutions. And a good case in point that we're all looking at right now is Egypt. Okay. I mean, one of the answers to Egypt, if there is an answer to, to change in Egypt, it has to be reform of the security institutions, most importantly, the military. 
and a complete uh, uh, change of the police. Um, but the military, right now, um, is sitting above the democratic process. They're kind of like they have a veto. You know? If they don't like what goes on, they swoop in. So you have in Egypt, you know, democratic processes taking place, very robust civil society. Um, but you have a military that's sitting out here. And, and until um, that military is brought into um, the, the process of change, which means accepting civilian control, uh, rule law. And, and by the way, not getting to own 40% of the economy. <laughs> Um, <laughs> By the way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the thing in Egypt is more about corporate interests than raw power. Oh, they don't really care who, 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 who wins and who loses as long as they maintain corporate power. Corporate power is worth 40% of the economy. And, and if those of you who go to, you know, from Egypt, live in Egypt, travel in Egypt, look at those places that the, the, the officers live. <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> really? Um, Craig, I think you had a yeah. point, and then actually what we're going to... Let me do a quick like two things if I could. Okay. Uh, and Jack, I just want to underscore something that Dick said. Uh, some of us at ICNC are very, have been close in the past to Dr. Saad Ibrahim, who was mm -hmm. is probably Egypt's most famous dissident, mm -hmm. uh, one of the most conspicuous dissidents and academics who was early arrested by Mubarak and regularly arrested by Mubarak. So he spent a lot of time in jail with the Muslim Brotherhood guys. And he said, oh, wait a minute, if you guys know them, he said, these guys are surviving when a liberal democracy arises, they may well be able to accommodate themselves to a liberal democracy. And over the period, it's not just because he was incarcerated, but I have, we happened to be meeting with him soon after Tahrir, and he was, as soon as Tahrir occurred and he saw the evolution of, of, of where he thought this would go, which wasn't fast, he said, the biggest priority is reforming the police. He said, we've got to get every expert in the world who knows how to reform police into this country and start talking sense to all these people who want various forms because none of this other change is going to occur unless the police are reformed. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the police, um, of course, were the, the real instrument of control. In, in some places, um, the instrument is the army. In, in, in Egypt, it really was the police. I mean, they're the ones that, 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 that did all the real ugly stuff. The military was allowed to, be, uh, to uh, develop this um, uh, special status. Now, I think both are a problem. The police, in, in many ways, might be easier because it's such a discredited institution. And so, um, you know, you can, you can, and there are, there's a, there are, there are, ah, there are some experts out there who know how to reform police, and, and the police might be easier. The military, to me, is the biggest problem because it, it has so much to lose. See, where the police, they've already lost. They've already lost. The question now is, who do you keep from the old police? You know, you, you kind of get them all together and you, you say, well, well, we'll keep these, but, but, and we're going to make sure they, they understand that the role of the police is not to put your foot on someone's neck and, and stuff like that. Now, there are these, this part of the police, yeah, we probably have to try them and, and uh, or figure out what we're going to do with these individuals who are really the, the human rights violators. The police, I think, is actually an easier institution. The, the military worries me much more because it's so invested. So how do you get them? In, in many ways, it's kind of the way the military existed. The, the thing that worries me about Egypt is that, that it, it, it adopts the old Turkish model. You have political change, you have polit elections and stuff like that, but the military decides whether or not it's going to swoop in and, and take control for a while and then, then come back out. Now Turkey doesn't have that anymore. It's interesting, change in Turkey, right? Now, I mean, it's still not quite over in Turkey, I mean, but, 
but the military is, is really undergoing some interesting change in Turkey. So, oh, sorry, I think Hardy has Sure. To I mean, I'll, my comment may be a non sequitur now because it relates to something about 20 minutes ago, but I just wanted to <laughs> come back. I've been trying to wait my turn. I just wanted to come back to the, the concept of sovereignty for a second because mm -hmm. I do think it's so critical. And um, you said that you know, sovereignty is questioned now in the sense that it, it depends in part on performance. And I, I would like to, you know, maybe state that differently and maybe similar or, or slightly divergent from what you're saying, but basically the concept of sovereignty resides in people. And so that if there is not a regular democratic mechanism for conveying it to the government, then how can the government possibly assert it? That may be what you were saying. It may just be a different way of putting it, but just really starkly, unless there are regular opportunities for people to give their sovereignty, the sovereignty ultimately resides in them. And then the question is, well, well, then two things come out. One is there are a whole lot of states claim, you know, authoritarians claiming sovereignty that have never actually been granted that authority. And then two, even if they have sovereignty, what does that actually entitle them to assert? Because it, it, I, I'm not a legal scholar, but my understanding is, that the concept of sovereignty developed primarily as a way of saying, you're not going to invade me and I'm not going to invade you. You're not going to arm my rebels and I won't arm yours. Now, you know, laws and norms evolve over time. But now sovereignty is being used, but first of all, by people who aren't sovereign claiming it. And then saying, and by the way, it, it enables me to embargo information and do all these other things. Mm -hmm. they, 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 they claim there's something that's not theirs, and then they've said it. it, it you know, it, it basically gives me complete immunity within my own borders. Yes. And it seems to me that a normative framework hasn't been developed internationally to deal with any of that. And, and it's very clear within the old sovereign model, if we look at Syria, okay, Russia can, can arm Assad, Iran can support Assad, you know, and that's all, you know, within this the rules of the game. False, yeah, rules of the game, but not really actually based on rules, based on sort of accepted North. kind of norms, yeah. yeah. Because the rules actually say that, that well, look, maybe the rules aren't, aren't useful at this point, but, but um, or that's not a useful concept for the moment, but, but Let me come what does the rest of the world do? Yeah. There's no normative framework for knowing what they should do. See, I, I think that what is happening, and, and, and I really would peg this to the end of the cold, because yeah. I think that that's where, where this begins. Up to that point, um, it, it, sovereignty was kind of the way that, that you, you described it, and that is um, states were, were seen as, as having sovereign right to control the area within their borders. And this was granted to them um, when they entered the, the United Nations. When they entered the United Nations, what went with that was sovereignty. Now, um, in the aftermath of the Cold War, um, some writers and thinkers on international relations, some legal, some more philosophical, um, started to, to raise this question of, well, sovereignty uh, is something that is a relationship not just between states, but between state and its population. And, and in order for um, this state to be sovereign and to have legitimacy, um, then that relationship between the, the state and its population has to be based on a set of principles. Now, Holstein talks about this in terms of vertical and horizontal legitimacy, um, but it, 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 it is a, it's a contractual arrangement. And when states don't perform those responsibilities, then there are those who would say that that, is, that government has lost sovereignty. So you make sovereignty contingent on performance. Now, these are arguments that are made. Um, these aren't norms that govern the behavior of the international community. Uh, if they were, um, we'd be a lot better off uh, than, than we currently are. But the interesting thing, I think, is how um, these arguments have and positions have 
um, developed over the last 20 some years. So that um, uh, I can't, you know, can, can you imagine 20, 25 years ago, um, the UN um, uh, taking uh, a position to protect a population that's being bulldozed by its, its government would never have happened. So we're in an evolutionary period. Yeah. And it just, if I, it just seems to me that, you know, with, the, with Libya, with Syria, with various other states, and we'll continue to see instances like this happen of civil resistance met with deep brutality. And that's not a foregone conclusion that the civil resistance loses, but it seems like there's a whole amount of creative thinking that needs to go on about about how to address that situation that doesn't just involve this binary bomb or not bomb. That's right. You know, choice. And that, I, it, so here's the question in my comment. Do you, is, do you think that's a developing? I mean, those conversations are happening. Do you think that will actually develop in some sense? You know, I want to be hopeful. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I would say that I think we're, 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 we're moving in ways that uh, I would have never uh, fathomed you know, when I started out in this business. So, yeah, there's, there's real change taking place. Now, if I just stay on the Syrian example, the thing that, that we, which kind of depresses me, though, is, well, a couple of things. One, we don't do any, anything. I mean, that, that's really depressing. But secondly, that our solution is, for some, and, and, and this is true in Washington, you know, the argument of army. And I'm not sure that army, I don't feel army is the answer. I think safety is the answer. That, that if you can create, let's just say we're going to make one-fourth of Syria a safe zone. Well, we could do that. The, 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 the major powers could do that. And now it does involve some force, but I can assure you that after the first armored column, the second one will not come so fast, simply because they understand the consequences of it. And that throws everything into uh, disarray. But I don't know if that's a good solution. It, you know, I mean, I would rather s see the, the Syrian population being able to take control. But they need some help, I think. So, we actually have somebody with their hand raised from Syria. Hi, so thanks for uh, talking about Syria. I want to go a little bit on uh, the subject of uh, the uh, no-go zone. So if, let's say we have no-go zone, what if Assad attacked the area? What will happen? He can't get in. He won't, he won't make it. You can put an air cap over that, but nothing's coming in. But we did it in, you think of Iraq as an example. Once the no-fly zone was created in northern Iraq, what you had in effect was a de facto Kurdish state. But why didn't it happen in Kosovo? Exactly. Why did Milosevic manage to expel everybody under the NATO airplane? Well, it wasn't done, you know, it wasn't done the, the most effective way, but you can create, my point is this, you know, Kosovo, not a good example. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Northern Iraq, good example. My, my point is that, <laughs> but the point is that you, you can you can use air power in that way, and 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 NATO has the air capability, so that 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 zone would be impregnable by anything major. Oh yeah, they can sneak, you know, a, a small group in to do something awful. But, but in terms of a major, of, of Assad sending a division, we're going to send a division there, or a core. We're going to send a core into the note, into the uh, safe zone. No. Another thing. Oh, okay. It's okay. Uh, another thing. So if we have no go, no go zone, and we are assuming that the full, like, expand after a while, but we are depending on the defection of the uh, military. And so, but we know that like mainly the military in Syria, it's from like uh, very close or like related to as The officers, senior officers. The, yeah, the senior officers. So what I'm saying that how we can guarantee that it will be defection. You have to work at it. 
I mean, there's a whole, um, there are other things that you have to do here to try to drive wedges in that military. It, it, ha it can happen. You know, you, I've seen it in, in uh, actually in other places where civil resistance has driven wedges into the security forces. Once they start to come apart, um, and, and see, that's what's interesting now. You're starting to group defections, not just by lower ranks, but some senior ranks. So that, to me, tells me very fluid. But interestingly now, those defections right now are coming when there was an increase of violent incidents against the, the elite forces of Assad, rather than for civil resistance. Yeah which uh, kind of puts into question our discussion about the effectiveness of civil resistance in facilitating defections, when those defections are occurring where there is more violence in Syria than less. But, the, the, but what if you, you add a safe zone? Then, then, then what happens? Mm -hmm. yeah. For just one second, you don't need defections, you need de-defection. Happens once, it collapses, not like small troops leaving. You know, it, it's interesting too, though, to see splits. For instance, um, I had a dissertation done by um, Annika Benendijk, and and it was pretty interesting in terms of how uh, in uh, in Ukraine and and in uh, in Serbia how um, uh, the civil resistance movement was able to um, network into the security forces. And, 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 you know, affect some of them, which served as a hedge against others. Security forces, militaries, are not um, one-dimensional animals, you know, and, and so uh, they can come apart. But, there ha but to me, um, if, if you're, you have to have some place to go. Right now, they don't have any place to go. That's why I'm, I think a, a no-fly zone or no go zone, creates a place where they can go. And then you, you, know, you flood it with uh, humanitarian assistance, and, and you have people in there who can, can help uh, in the negotiation among the factions, and so on. But, but it's safe. It doesn't work. It just works. Very short. No, I'm sorry. Okay.